Hey everybody, um, what we're talking about today is how to open a bank account without a social security number. Okay, so this is applicable in the U.S. only. Um, actually, in Canada, it's quite easy to open a bank account without a SIN number, they call it there. Uh, anyways, um, so um, let's begin. Uh, first of all, you have to understand that all banks are federal. All banks are instrumentalities of Congress. Nothing is guaranteed to work in every circumstance. I have, I used to open up these accounts on a regular basis, uh, but they, because of the so-called war on terror, which is really a war on me and you, uh, they've made it increasingly more difficult. And so um, you have to build a case against them. Um, and... Um, you know, it might work, it might not work, uh, but this is the only way to do it that I know about. And if you have to, file a lawsuit, you know, I mean, I can't be fighting all these battles all by myself. We need other people out there doing it. That's why I teach people about this stuff, because um, how to build a case against them. Um, the procedure in this work has worked with some banks. Bank of America currently is the easiest one to uh, open up a bank account without a social security number. Um and um, um, but we need to get other banks trained as well, okay? So uh, because of the so-called war, uh, war on terror has become more difficult, um, you have to build a case against them, and that's what all of this is. Um, um, I've even had banks arbitrarily close bank accounts because of no social security number, um, and um, I've. Um, in uh, Texas, I uh, think I've got it. I went and filed a, a petition to the Supreme Court, and um, I think I've got it to the point now that they don't charge filing fees to anybody but lawyers or in naturalization proceedings. I guess we'll see. Uh, but um, but um, I know other people have done stuff in the courts here in Texas since I did that, and there was no filing fee. Um, so we'll see what happens when I do it. Uh, anyways, um, that's where we're at. Um, to file a lawsuit, you, you have to pay the filing fee. And um, in Texas, at least, I think I've got it so that you don't have to pay the filing fee. Uh, anyways, we'll see. Um, anyways, this is uh, the Gold Reserve Act of 1934. It says the United States means the government of the United States. Currency of the United States means currency that's legal tender in the United States, which means that Federal Reserve notes are in, meant for internal use of the government only. Okay, and and that's true. Okay, DC. Actually, it's less than DC. It's internal use of the government. That's it. Um, a negotiable instrument uh, law is a subset of Roman law, which is and the UCC. Okay, so Roman law comes from the Vatican. <clears throat> Federal Reserve notes fall under negotiable instrument law. Um, and this is a cite from Black's Law Dictionary, 4th edition. Civil law, Roman law, Roman civil law, convertible phrases mean the same system of jurisprudence that rule of action which every particular nation, commonwealth, or city has established peculiarly for itself, more properly called municipal law, to distinguish it from the law of nature and from international law. Okay, so there, uh, when you go into that, you have to understand that that's where you're going. Okay, you're going into this when you get a bank account. It's all under the Uniform Commercial Code and um, and municipal law. Okay, it's all satanic. It's all from the Roman law. And I, quite frankly, I wouldn't even be doing it except that they basically compel you because uh, there's so many brain dead idiots out there that want to use Federal Reserve notes. Anyways. State statutes are actually federal statutes. This is taken from a publication uh, called um, the Report of the Interdepartmental Committee for the Study of Jurisdiction over Federal Areas Within the States, Part 2, and um, a text of the Law of Legislative Jurisdiction submitted to the Attorney General and transmitted to the President June 1957. Okay, so this is on page 158 of Part 2. And it talks about the international law rule adopted for areas under federal legislative jurisdiction. Okay, so all state statutes are actually federal statutes. It federalizes state civil law, including common law. The rule serves to federalize not only the statutory, but the common law of the state. And um, um, 
And then it goes on, on page 165 of the same document, it talks about state and federal venue discussed, the civil laws effective in an area of exclusive federal jurisdiction, and you got to re- our federal law, okay? And so anywhere where there's a zip code, okay, is federal. And so you have to understand that. That's why I tell them I'm zip code exempt. That's why I use postage per queue, um, because postal per queue, because, because again, that's international. Okay, watch my postal per queue video. And so it's all international, and you have to use that if you want to, you know, they all work on presumption. So you have to work, create the presumption that you're not their slave. Okay, otherwise, if you're federal, you're a slave. You're a property, you're a piece of property, and that's it. Anyways, a cause arising under such laws may be brought in or removed to federal district court under sections 24 of the former judicial code, now sections 1331 and 1441 of Title 28, giving jur- jurisdiction to courts of civil actions arising under the laws of the United States where the matter in controversy exceeds $3,000. Now, and so the, the point being is that um, this is... It's under United States Code, okay, now you have to understand that United States Code, when they bring in, when you bring an action, the, the court, okay, is a clerk masquerading as a judge, and the reason he's a clerk masquerading as a judge, because the first thing he'll say when, when he says he has jurisdiction is under this code or that code. <laughs> so he's saying, I want to be a clerk masquerading as a judge. <laughs> okay, <laughs> got that? <laughs> And this is the Uniform Commercial Code. This is uh, found at 77 Stat 630. That's the Statutes at Large, Book 77, and page 630, Public Law 88-243. And that's an act to enact the Uniform Commercial Code for the District of Columbia and for other purposes. Okay, and so, again, if you go back to the, under international law, that's why this is effective in all the states. They've all passed laws, but it's only applicable to U.S. citizens in D.C. and the territories. And so, again, when you open a bank account, you're not necessarily a U.S. citizen, but they're busy fabricating evidence of that, I can tell you right now. And so, um, e, e, it's all federal. That's what you have to understand. The United States, this is Uniform Section 9.307, location of debtor, is the United States is located in the District of Columbia. Okay, that's the District of Columbia. You're in the D.C. Federal Reserve Notes, this is uh, chapter, uh, this is actually found at uh, 59 Stat 238. Um, It says, it's chapter 186, an act to amend section 11C and 16 of the Federal Reserve Act. And so then section 3, it says... All power and authority with respect to the issuance of circulating notes, known as Federal Reserve notes, uh, shall cease and terminate on the date of the enactment of this act. Okay, so um, Congress and the Federal Reserve and the Secretary of the Treasury do not have any authority over Federal Reserve notes. They're basically turning it back over to the banksters. Okay, if you think about it, the banksters have complete control. And then Section 4, it talks about the same thing, except for... um, it's talking about um, U.S. Treasury notes, okay? So it's they're turning them all over to the banksters, and this was in 1945. Um, this is the Federal Tax Lien Act of 1966, Public Law 89-719, found at 80 Stat uh, 1130 to 1131. This is uh, actually, uh, this is as the definition section. For purpose of this section and section 6324, security interest means any interest in property acquired by contract. A security interest exists if, A, the property is in existence and the interest has become protected under local law against subsequent judgment lien arising out of an unsecured obligation. Okay, so again, they have to go into local law and and um, they it's an unsecured obligation. And that's what they do is they they use the Uniform Commercial Code to create this fictitious lien. And so the important thing to understand is that they're talking about 
uh, the, the bottom four, the at paragraph four, a security is the term means any bond, a venture, note, or a certificate, or other evidence of indebtedness. Okay, well, um, a, a Federal Reserve note is evidence of the federal debt. Okay, that's found. That's in Title Thirty One. It's a. It's a. Uh, and uh, so, so it's a note. It's a evidence of indebtedness. It's a negotiable instrument. It's money. Okay, it falls. I mean, they cover everything in here. And so um, uh, that's you're in the District of Columbia. When you set foot inside a bank, you are setting foot in the District of Columbia. Okay, and this is the DC code. Okay, so uh, this is an act to establish a code of law for the District of Columbia, which is approved March 3rd, 1901. Um, and it says, uh, this is right at the beginning of the act, says, third, the word person shall be held to apply to partnerships and corporations. Okay, so it's all fictitious entities. An act to, this is uh, further on in the act of the, uh, the uh, act to establish code of law for the District of Columbia in uh, section uh, 1617. See, that act is like about, it's probably 50, 60 pages at least. Um, I don't know how many pages it is in the United States Code, but it's a bunch. Anyways, the legal estate to be in a SESTIC use, okay? And so everything is in a SESTIC trust. Why do you think that they spell your name on all block capital letters on land title documents? Why do you think that the tax assessor, when they send you their extortion letter, that they're spelled the name on all block capital letters? It's a SESTIC trust that they're talking to. Okay, that's exactly what it is. It's a fictitious entity. You're in D.C., and that's the argument, okay, is that I'm not a U.S. citizen. I'm not in D.C. Um, a citizen of the United States is a civilly dead entity operating as co-trustee and co beneficiary of the Public Charitable Trust and Constructive Sestake Trust of U.S. Inc. under the 14th Amendment, which upholds the debt of USA and USA Inc. And somebody contacted me about this you know, recently, that's a summary, okay, anybody ever seen the congressional record, okay, if you look at the congressional record, the print is extremely small, it's three columns on a, on a, like, uh, um, on a huge page, um, that's, you know, what, uh, it's, it's not, uh, eight and a half by 11, it's more like about 10 by 14 or something like that, and, um, and it's about size eight print, it's tiny, Okay, and this is a summary. Notice it says page 15,641 through 15,646. Well, that's five pages of that. Okay, and so this is a summary of what that says. Um, anyways, every taxpayer is assessed to K trust having sufficient interest in preventing the abuse of the trust to be recognized in the field of this court's prerogative jurisdiction. So, again, um, they can only deal with the dead thing. Ex parte Frank Knowles. Uh, it might be correctly and said that there is no such thing as a citizen of the United States. A citizen of any one of the states of the Union is held to be a called a citizen of the United States, although technically and abstractly there is no such thing. It's a fraud. Okay. Maxwell versus Dow. The privileges and immunities of a citizen of the United States do not necessarily include all the rights protected by the first eight amendments of the federal constitution against the powers of the federal government. In other words, if you're a U.S. citizen, you have no rights. Okay? Matter of fact, the next site says that. The only absolute and unqualified right of a U.S. citizen is the residence within the territory of boundaries of the United States. That's the only absolute and unqualified right. Okay? Other rights can be granted by Congress. Okay? And, and so they put stuff in, in the United States Code and uh, that grants rights to U.S. citizens, okay? But you got to understand a U.S. citizen's basically, it's a fictitious entity and it's operating in interstate commerce. It falls under the Commerce Clause and uh, it's, it's a slave. It's a piece of property. It's a fictitious entity. It has no rights. Property does not have rights. Citizenship is a political status and may be defined in privilege limited by Congress. The term resident and citizen of the United States is distinguished from a citizen of one of the several states and that the former is a special class of citizen created by Congress. The term citizen of the United States is analogous to the term subject in the common law. So you want to be a U.S. citizen? That's where you're at. 
We therefore decline to overrule the opinion of Chief Justice Marshall. We hold that the pres uh, District of Columbia is not a state within Article 3 of the Constitution. In other words, cases between citizens of the district and those of the states were not included in the catalog of controversies over which Congress could give jurisdiction to the federal courts by virtue of Article 3. In other words, Congress has exclusive legislative jurisdiction over citizens of Washington District of Columbia and through their plenary power nationally covers those citizens even when in one of the several states as though the district expands for the purpose of regulating its citizens wherever they go throughout the states of the union. That's National Mutual Insurance Company of the District of Columbia versus Tidewater Transfer Company. Obviously, it's two fictitious entities. They're in interstate commerce. And that's the U.S. Supreme Court, 1948. If any citizen or resident of the United States does not reside in or is not found in any United States judicial district, such citizen or resident shall be treated as residing in the District of Columbia for purposes of any provisions of this title to A, jurisdiction of courts, or B, enforcement of summons. Okay, this is where it's codified. Okay, and that's 26 U.S.C. 770139 or 26 U.S.C. 7408C. Now, the difference is, is one was an old version of the of the United States Code, and and they revised it all, and it turned into the other one. And I don't know which is which. So there's two states in every state. There's a lawful state and a federal territory, which is a municipal corporation. There has been created a fictional federal state of XXX within a state. See Howard Sinking Fund of Louisville, um, and that's cited in this uh, Schwartz versus O'Hara Township School District. The Judicial Code of 1911, Chapter 231, which is found at 36 Stat 1087. Um, and this particular site is found at 36 Stat 1088, which is the second page of the Judicial Code. An act to codify, uh, it says here, OLS Section 9, that's the one we're interested in. The district courts, as courts of admiralty and as courts of equity, shall be deemed always to be open for the purpose of filing any pleading of issuing, you know, whatever. Uh, the point is, is that uh, district federal courts are admiralty and equity. And this is chapter two in the same statute, Judicial Code of 1911, and this is on 1091. That was on 1088, so that's three pages later. District courts, the district courts shall have original jurisdiction as follows. First of all, since suits of civil nature at common law and equity brought by United States. And arises under the constitutional laws of the United States or treaties under their authority, or B is between citizens of different states, or C between citizens of a state and foreign states, uh, citizens or subjects. And um, and it's interesting to note here it says no district court shall have cognizance of any suit except upon bills of exchange. Okay, to recover upon any promissory note or other chosen action in favor of an assignee. Okay, so the only thing they deal with is Federal Reserve notes. That's what that bills of exchange is, okay? They're calling it nice there, bills of exchange. It's actually an IOU. Third of all, civil causes of admiralty and maritime jurisdiction saving to suitors in cases of a right have a common law remedy where the common law is competent to give it. And so the point is, is this is the jurisdiction of the federal courts, and they only deal in IOUs. The term, and this is where it's codified, what, uh, well, not that, what the, that's not what that's codified, but this is where in the D.C. codes, the term individual means a citizen of the United States or an alien lawfully admitted for permanent residence. The term federal personnel means officers and employees of the government of the United States, members of the uniformed services, including members of the reserve components, individuals entitled to receive immediate or deferred retirement benefits under any retirement program under the government of the United States, including survivor benefits. Okay, so think about that. What that means is that federal personnel is anybody with a social security number. So when you give them a social security number at the bank, you are telling them you're a government employee. Okay, that's exactly what you're telling them, people. You're telling them you're a government employee. I don't know about you, but I don't have a social security number. Remember, a, a taxpayer is a SESTA-K trust. We covered that earlier. So therefore... If you are a SESTA-K trust, then I guess you do have one. But last time I looked, I got fingers. Matter of fact, I'm touching my fingers right now and my arms. And so 
I'm not a SESTIC trust. And my first case when I went to the Supreme Court, I told them that I don't have a Social Security number. I have never had a Social Security number. That was no problem. And I was suing the IRS, by the way. <laughs> no problem. You do not have, well, I mean, I know I don't have one. If you have one, then you just turned yourself into a slave. That's exactly what you did. And another thing they use is a fictitious war name, a non de guerre, which is capitus diminutio. It's Roman law. Remember, it's all fun that falls under Roman law and the Vatican. And capitus diminutio maxima. Why do you think they spell your name in all block capital letters on a bank account? Because you are a slave. You are a piece of property. They're dealing with that sesticate trust, which has no rights. This occurred when a man's condition was changed from one of freedom to one of bondage. When he became a slave. Capitus diminutio maxima. Um, this is a DC code again. This is just confirming what we just talked about. It's and fourth, okay, so this is right up at the front of the DC code. It says fourth, wherever the word executor is used, it shall include administrator and vice versa, unless uh, such application of the term would be unreasonable. And so that's that's it's all dealing with dead things. Get a load of this. This is in the DC code again. It says in section um, 1563. It says, what can be set off? Set off. Notice it's set off because they know that nothing is paid, okay, in D.C. If you're in D.C., nothing is paid for. It's set off. It even talks about set off in the Constitution, okay? If you don't know that, then you need to read the Constitution because it talks about set off in the Constitution. It talks about set off in the uh, early, in the um, um in the early, all of the, and not all of the early documents, but in the early do articles of confederation and places like that in the early founding documents of America. It says mutual debts and claims under contract between parties to a common law action or between one party and the testator or intestate of the other, or between testators or intestates of both parties may be set off. Okay, so again, they're talking about dead things and they're talking about set off debts. Okay, that's exactly what's going on. So, this is 26 U.S.C. 6109, section 6109. This is in the United States Code, and it talks about supplying identifier numbers. We are required by regulations prescribed by the Secretary, uh, inclusion and returns, furnishing numbers of the persons, furnishing numbers of another person. Any person required under the authority of this title to make a return statement or other document with respect to another person shall request from such other person and shall include in any such return statement or other documents such identifying numbers may be prescribed. Okay? It says request. It doesn't say demand. It doesn't say extort. It doesn't say anything but request. Their only duty is to request it. Okay? Request. That's nothing more than just ask for it. Okay? That's it. Nothing more. And this is the codes, okay? This uh, 26 U.S.C. section 6109 actually didn't exist until uh, the so-called War on Terror came about. And uh, anyways, this is uh, the codes, the regulations under that 6109. And I got the highlighted portion, but I got the text. I got it closer up for the, for the highlighted portion. Uh, but here's the text. And it says... If the person making the return statement or other document does not know the taxpayer identification of the other person, such and such other person, and it goes on, such person must request the other person's number. And when the person making the return statement or other document does not know the number of the other person and has complied with the request provision of this paragraph, okay, in other words, when they don't, don't know the number and they've asked for it, and they don't have it, such person just make an affidavit on the transmittal document forwarding such return statements or other documents to the IRS. So stating, that's all they have to do, just make an affidavit. Well, what I am suggesting, what I do, is I make an affidavit, and I give it to them. And, and, and so then 
I say I don't have a social security number. I've never had a social security. I give it to them if they want to give that to the to the IRS. Then they're more than welcome to. But they're covered that way. Uh, these these banks are thieves. They're thieves. Okay, and and they'll just refuse to open the bank account. Okay, they don't mind violating your rights under the color of law. And so that's where we need to sue them. Okay, and uh, everybody's got to pick their battles. That's not one of my battles. That's a big high priority right now. And so. Everybody's got to pick their battles, and and um, but somebody needs to sue the bastards. If you excuse my French. Um, so a summary to this point: a U.S. citizen is a SESTK trust. All banks are in the District of Columbia. All banks operate under the Uniform Commercial Code. Federal Reserve notes are meant for internal use of the government only. All banks are instrumentalities of Congress. A bank account is essentially an account with Congress. Okay, that's true. And banks are required to attempt to get evidence of their U.S. citizen slave. And uh, but this is under Title 18, United States Code, Section 242. Whoever, under color of any law, statute, ordinance, regulation, or custom, willfully subjects any inhabitant of any state, territory, commonwealth, possession, or district to the deprivation of any rights, privileges, or immunity secured or protected by the Constitution or laws of the United States shall be fined under this title or imprisoned. Uh, and then it goes on. It's uh, in this public law. It's substituted person in any state for inhabitant of any state. So uh, the bottom line is that that um, they're committing a felony. Okay? You have to build a case against an individual. The corporations don't commit felonies. The individuals do. And what they do is they set their liars, set them up to protect them and let them get away with it. So it's, you know, you can still sue them and you can still get them in hot water, uh, but you're probably not going to get anybody in jail uh, because they're liars set it all up that way. Um, and this is 241. This is, uh, so Title 18, United States Code 242 was the last one. This is 241. If two or more persons conspire to injure, oppress, threaten, or intimidate any person in any state, territory, commonwealth, pos uh, possession, or district, in the free exercise or enjoyment of any right or privilege secured to him by the Constitution or laws of the United States, or because of his uh, having so exercised same, or if two or more persons go in disguise on the highway under the premise of another with a prevent intent to prevent, hinder his free exercise or enjoyment of any uh, right so secured. Okay, so this is the conspiracy one. And so you could actually allege that in a lawsuit quite easily. Um, the District of Columbia is bankrupt. Okay, watch my bankrupt corporate government videos. Uh, the District of Columbia is owned and operated by the banksters. The District of Columbia is the New World Order. It's the bankster thieves. The Vatican and the United uh, States, see the United States uh, is a crown colony video, one and two, and the video called The Crown is owned and operated by the Vatican. Um, the bankster thieves are in the process of stealing everything they can. So uh, some guidelines, some guidelines about your bank account. Okay, it's up to you. I'm not, I'm not going to tell you, but I can tell you that I don't keep any more money in the bank than I absolutely need to pay bills, and that is it. Okay, they're going to do a Cyprus. Okay, I got to tell you that that's coming. They, I don't keep excess Federal Reserve notes. I Well, I do keep, if I have some extra ones, then I keep them stored away. I wrap them in tinfoil. They have devices that they can scan and pick up. That, what do you think that platinum strip is in there? Okay, they can, they can tell how much money. I don't know if they can walk, drive by your house and have detectors that'll check it. Um, but I know that they have them in airports, the customs pigs assault people all the time. That's why they want to know if you have more than $10,000 worth of cash, and they steal it, and, and and it's impossible. If you don't declare it, and then you have to essentially justify why you got so much cash, um, they'll steal it, okay? They're nothing but thieves. Um, and also, something to, I'm hearing recently is that, um, is that they're going to start, they're going to go to a cash card, okay? And it's not going to be a, a chip, okay? I think that uh, uh, um, that a lot of people are alerted to the chip. And so um, from what I'm hearing is they're not going to go to a chip. Well, a chip will be in a cash card. 
and they're going to pull all the money out of circulation. They're going to devalue the dollar a couple of times, at least by about 50% at least. And, um, and, uh, and they're going to come out. You're going to have to go to the post office and register yourself for a cash card. And, and, uh, and they're going to, they're going to pull the money, the cash out of circulation. And, um, the uh, the hundred dollar bills are going to be the first ones. They've already talked about the hundred dollar bills on the news media, and if you have hundred dollar bills and you start trading in a bunch of hundred dollar bills, the first thing they're going to want to know is they're going to start raking you over the coals. They're going to want to know where you got them, and they're going to be submitting reports to the IRS. And so, um, I would be getting rid of hundred dollar bills for sure. And keep small bills, 20s, 10s, 5s, and 1s. And only only really need two to three months maximum. And otherwise, I'd be buying gold and silver um, and Bitcoin. And um, you can, um, you can um, do the, uh, what, if you need more, you can always exchange the Bitcoin or the gold and silver back into Federal Reserve notes. When this stuff goes down, when they devalue the dollar, the price of silver and gold are going to go through the roof. And so, um, you know, they're going to, that, that's, that's, you're going to make some money there. Um, anyways, so plan for another Cyprus event here. Okay. These bankster thieves are going to, are in the process of stealing everything. They set it up for decades. Watch my bankster thieves one, two, and three videos. Um, anyways, bottom line is, is when you go to open your bank account, you have to be prepared. And take a copy of 26 CFR section 301.6109 and uh, Title 18 United States Code section 241 and 242. Take an affidavit that says you do not have a social security number. Take two forms of common law identification and a couple forms of government identification if you're prepared to use it. And if you have a foreign passport, use that. Okay, that's perfect. A foreign passport is perfect. The banksters will probably have a list of acceptable forms of identification. Uh, the banksters will probably want to know a physical address. I use my daughter's, okay? I have a mailbox that I've used for decades. Um, they've recently been arbitrarily shutting down bank accounts because I don't... Uh, um, I refuse to give my physical address, so now I use my daughter's. Um, another thing you can do is is tell them you travel, travel a lot. Give them rent a hotel room. Give them the hotel room's address. <laughs> I do that. Anyways, um, you can or a friend. Give them a friend's address. Okay. I mean, they just want a physical address. It's going to show on their computer that it's not a commercial address. Okay, and. And uh, so there's ways of, uh, of dealing with that, okay, these thieves. It's, it's part of the New World Order is so they can, uh, Homeland Security pigs, know where you're living so they can, when they want to start rounding up their, uh, their people to murder them, uh, that's, that's what they'll do. Um, uh, take a couple of witnesses, record it if possible, okay? Every bank will be different. Bank of America is the easiest to get a bank account without a social security number, but they're going to want this other stuff, I guarantee you. Do not go there expecting that they will not open the account, okay? If you go there expecting that they're not going to open your account, well, that's probably what's going to happen. It's going to be like a self-fulfilling prophecy, okay? Go there prepared to stand your ground and build a case against them. Do not go there in a position that you, where you have to absolutely have a bank account, okay? Be prepared to walk down the street to another bank. And um, Bank of America has open account for me and other people I know without a social security number. Explain to them that you want to open an account. Explain to them that you do not have a social security number. Explain to them that there's no law that says that anyone has to have a social security number. Explain to them that their only requirement is to request the information and provide an affidavit to satisfy their requirement. Once they have your date of birth, they may try to verify you by getting you to verify common public information. Well, that is actually accessing the credit report and tell them no. Okay, you give them, they have requirements of two photo IDs. If they accept those, that's all they need. Okay, they're collecting information if they do something more than that. 
Okay. Provide the identification they require, common law first, and as a last resort, their government ID. Explain that's a felony for them to violate your rights under the color of their regulations. And they'll probably tell you that they're liars told them to do it. Ah, so then they would commit murder to it if their liar told them to do that? Ask them if the courts would look favorably on them. I mean, it depends on how much you want to push it. Okay? I mean, you could ask them if the courts would look favorably on them if their liars told them to commit a felony. Anyways, the text in the affidavit can be short and sweet. Okay? Mine was short and sweet. It's one page. That's, I declare that I, there is no law that says anybody has to go to social security number, and I do not have a social security number, and I have never had a social security number. That's, that's it. That's all you need. And put on the notary. By the time you get all that stuff on there, um, then it's going to be, you know, it's going to take up a page anyways. The end justifies the means of satanic, all these these Satanists, these bankster thieves are Satanists, okay? Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil and put darkness for light and light for darkness. It behooves every man who values liberty of conscience for himself to resist invasions of it in case of others, or their case may, by change of circumstances, become its own. Okay, so I am trying to help you out. Um, and what goes around comes around. It's called pay it forward. If ye love wealth better than liberty, the tranquility of servitude better than the animating contest of freedom, go home from us in peace. We ask not your counsel or arms, crouch down and lick the hands which feed you. May your chains set lightly upon you, and may our posterity forget that you are ever our country. When it shall be said, in any country of the world, my poor are happy, neither ignorance or distress is to be found among them, my jails are empty of prisoners, my streets of beggars, the aged are not in want, the taxes are not oppressive, the rational world is my friend, because I am a friend of its happiness. When these things can be said, then may that country boast of its constitution and government. Well, I can tell you that we have nothing to boast of here. There's bag people all over the place. The, uh, the the tax collectors are thieves. Um, uh, the jails are full of prisons. I mean, it's the opposite end of that. Okay, we have nothing to bag brag about here. We have a bunch of Satanists that have seized control of the government. But if the watchmen see the sword come and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take away any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at the watchman's hands. And so my the reason I'm putting this out is because I want to be blameless on Judgment Day, and I want to help as many people as I can. Hopefully you're uh, blameless too. I hope you are. I sincerely do. And But you need to do your part to spread the word. Either you're part of the problem or you're part of the solution. You're now a watchman. And circulate this video far and wide or make up your own. If you make some good ones up, send me a link. I'd like to see them. Maybe I'll add them to one of my playlists or something. Upcoming videos. PayPal criminals. Okay, actually, it's eBay criminals because PayPal is owned by eBay. Do-it-yourself habeas corpus. Estoppel certificates. How to disappear. Do-it-yourself how to disappear. Okay, that's something that, that uh, I have actually done fairly well. But um, there's varying degrees of that. And uh, so I will be talking about how you can disappear. And uh, if you're truly a state citizen, they won't be able to see you. Okay, you will disappear. Other videos that you need to watch. Okay, Bankster Thieves 1, 2, and 3. We talked about that in this video. Okay, Churchianity series. Okay, all of these so-called churches, so-called Christian churches, most of them are satanic. Bankrupt cold so-called governments. Okay, that's another one we talked about. Bar members, one and two. You ought to watch those ones. Bar, actually, I think there's a three, too. Unidroit, martial laws here. Do-it-yourself kangaroo courts. Uh, Do-it-yourself traffic stop. All courts are ecclesiastical courts. Do-it-yourself toll roads. Okay, these people are thieves. They're grabbing money every possible way they can. And uh, they're nothing but thieves. And um, so... The toll roads is a good example. They're converting a right into a privilege. You can ignore it with impunity, okay? But they're going to 
They've set stuff up so they can assault you and do all sorts of stuff. So you got to take away their presumptions. You got to go in the attack. These people are Satanists. Copies of these documents can be found in my private group at Yahoo called Administering Your Public Servants. I have YouTube videos that are videos of private information shares that show these and other court citations that are available for a donation. Donations to support this work are appreciated. I prefer gold or silver coin, but as an extremely less desirable alternative, I can accept. I'll use Federal Reserve notes, PayPal, gifts, checks, money orders, etc. Send me an email for particulars. Um, this last paragraph is for all the Satanist order followers, revenue officers that uh, seem to think that I'm getting some privilege or benefit. You can take your privileges and benefits and put them up your rectal orifice. And um, if you find this useful, then you can. You need to pay it forward. And if you don't know what pay it forward means, then watch the video. My blog is sovereigntyinternational.wordpress.com. My website is sovereigntyinternational.fyi. My email is engineerwin at yahoo. Um, and so you can contact me there if you want to know how you can make a donation. Um, YouTube profile, Sovereign Living. I got a Facebook community page called Sovereignty International and a private group called Sovereignty International. I also have private groups at Yahoo and Google um, called uh, Administering Your Public Service. I appreciate you taking the time to watch my video. I hope you got something out of it, and, and you got to put it to work and, uh, and try some things. And if you have some successes, I'd like to know about them. Um, matter of fact, my blog is a great place for you to uh, uh, put your successes. If you don't put them, I'd like to put them. I won't put them without your permission, but uh, certainly uh, that's a great place to put successes. And so um, I appreciate you taking the time to watch the video, and I hope you have a real nice day.